Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? First, we're very grateful that you're all here today, very grateful. Uh, we have a full house, as you can see, a very full house. But we are delighted to have you here, and we are going to begin today with a presentation of the colors by the Santa Ana Police Department Honor Guard, who we are very honored to have do this for us. Thank you. Mr. Alex Diaz of the U.S. Naval Reserve and Chairman of Veterans First will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ladies and gentlemen, please place your right hand over your left shoulder. Ready, begin. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please remain standing. Uh, we are honored to have Pastor Frank Mauricio of the Wounded Warrior Ministries to lead us in prayer. If everybody would please be seated. This is a, a short memorial type of service. I don't want anybody passing out there. The greatest gift or sacrifice any person can make is to lay down their life to save another or to save their country. Shalom, ladies and gentlemen. Today we remember our Holocaust victims. They were casualties of a war that they didn't ask for. I know about this because my stepmother and my step-grandfather were also casualties of that war, but they made it through because they could speak six different languages. But they wore the mark of the registration on their forearm. She asked me, why does God allow wars and what is our purpose here? And I said, God doesn't allow wars, Mom. God despises them, but he gave man free will to make their own decisions, whether they choose good or evil, good or bad. And as we know, during the Holocaust, we had some bad people out there. I called them the devil people, the shadow people. And then she asked me, what is our purpose here in life? And in the book of Jeremiah, in the first chapter, Jeremiah asked God, he said, why am I here? What is my purpose here? God answered him and said, I knew your name before you were born. I knew you would be a prophet to my people. And what God is trying to tell us is that he knows the time of our birth before we're born, our names. He knows how long we're going to be here. And he knows at the end of our, when we're going to die. But can we change our destiny, we ask ourselves. And yes, we can, but only if the man can change. But we can't change the time of our end. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, it says, The Lord will settle international disputes. All nations will convert their weapons of war into implements of peace. Then all wars will stop and all military training will end. In other words, the Bible is trying to tell us there will be a day when we have peace in this nation and peace in the world. People turn to America because we are blessed by God, but we have to stay in God's ways. The people that sacrificed in 1936 or 34 when it started, over six million Jews and three million Russian soldiers were sacrificed because they were casualties of war. And the United States came to help them. We must remember that it is in God we trust here, and if we take God out of the equation, we're going to be one nation gone under. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we ask for your blessings on this group of men and women who come to you as children in their walk of faith. We ask that you hold your hand of comfort over those serving in harm's way. We ask that you hold close to your heart those that have fallen before us. We ask that you bless the Holy Land and her turmoil right now overseas as she fights for justice or injustice. And may we the people always be able to say, may God bless America, for it is in God we trust. Amen. Shalom. Thank you. This exhibit is being sponsored by the Foundation for California, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and SNCF, the French National Railway. The exhibit was first created by the Simon Wiesenthal Center by some of the best exhibit designers in the world 
for the 50th anniversary of the Anschluss, the day that Hitler marked, marched in to uh, Austria and formed the Greater Reich. It was opened in Vienna, an appropriate place. It has been seen in all the great capitals of the world. It has been seen throughout the United States. And indeed, uh, Mr. Ted Gover, who many of you know, you know him, you don't know me, so he should actually be up here doing this. He leaves tonight to meet with Rabbi Cooper from the Simon Wiesenthal Center to open a Holocaust exhibit similar to this in Bangkok uh, with the United Nations and the Israeli Embassy. We recently opened one in Mumbai, and we've opened one throughout Asia. Over two and a half million people came to Japan to see uh, the exhibit in Tokyo and around Japan. It's been extraordinary. Uh, this exhibit, in part, is sponsored by the Foundation for California because the Simon Wiesenthal Center is a fixed asset. It has a beautiful building. It is a great museum in the west side of Los Angeles, but not everyone can get to it. So we've taken this exhibit in the early 1990s throughout the state of California to schools, to libraries, to police stations, uh, almost to anyone who would have us. And then people wanted us and wanted us. Frankly, we did this till we ran out of money. Uh, there is enormous appetite today for Holocaust education. 60 years after the Holocaust, there is enormous appetite for Holocaust education. We live at a time when we hear frequently often from the enemies of the United States, but from others, that the Holocaust didn't happen. It never occurred. Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial is one side of a coin. The other side of the coin is Holocaust denial is the mother's milk of terrorism. Terrorists are nursed on Holocaust denial. So it is more important than ever at this time for us to remember the Holocaust, to relearn its lessons, and to tell everyone we know about those lessons so that this does not happen again. I'm a professor. I'm used to speaking in 55-minute increments followed by a test. Today, I'm going to shut up right now. It is my pleasure to call up here uh, Supervisor Janet Noonien, uh, who may not be able to stay for the whole program. This is her district. This is the first supervisor or, supervisorial district of Orange County, and we are just delighted to have her here today. So Janet, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, good morning. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Simon Riesenthal Center and the Foundation for California for bringing this important exhibit to the city of Santa Ana. As mentioned, welcome to the first district. I would also like to thank the city of Santa Ana for hosting the exhibit. Most importantly, I want to thank everyone here in attendance today. Your presence is a tribute to Orange County and to our community's commitment to make this a welcoming place to all people. The Courage to Remember exhibit poses to us three significant challenges. One, today we are challenged to remember. Two, we are challenged to educate. Three, we are challenged to commit. The horror of the Holocaust must never be forgotten. Families were ripped apart. Children never saw their parents again. In total, over six million Jews and millions of others who were considered outcasts by the Nazi regime. To suppress the memory of the tragic horror carried out by the Nazis would result in an unspeakable disservice to those that were victimized by its evil. We must remember but our duty does not end there. The impact of the Holocaust and the valuable lessons that can be taken from history's most deadly horror benefit us only if we take proactive steps to educate ourselves, our children, and the future. Organizations like the Simon Riesenthal Center and the Foundation of California play a vital role in distilling the causes of the Holocaust and ensuring that the origins of its hate are never, never again recreated. We must educate, but again, our duties does not end there. If we are to suppress hate through education, we must commit to that cause. This is a commitment not, not by one or only a few, but by our entire community. It is imperative that we empower our children to denounce actions and speech soiled by hate. 
Orange County's own Human Relations Commission is a thriving force in our community, focusing their efforts to foster mutual understanding among residents and eliminating prejudice, intolerance, and discrimination. I've been very fortunate enough to see firsthand the positive effect of the Human Relations Commission has done on Orange County. Just a few years ago, I spoke with the, at the Commission's Walk in My Shoes Youth Conference. It was great to see that more than 1,000 youth in attendance talk about the benefits of the Commission's Bridges and Bear Paw programs, both of which aim to inspire and motivate youth to change in their schools and communities. Anxious to express his enthusiasm, the Commission's program had one young Orange County resident at the conference. And he stated, I learned the effects of racism, discrimination, oppressions, and prejudice. I want to educate other students about the negative effects of discrimination as well. The voices and actions of the county's youth are very, very powerful. With the help of the Human Relations Commission, they have made the, it their mission to destroy intolerance at its source. It is imperative that we do the same. The courage to, ex to remember exhibit challenges as we remember the Holocaust, to educate ourselves about what caused the Holocaust, and to commit to ourselves to ensuring that it never happens again. Please join me and the children of Orange County in embracing that challenge today. I also understand that this exhibit is here for two weeks. Having had the opportunity to be here a little earlier, I was able to view most of the exhibits, and my office will be working with the organizer to see if we can move this and keep it in Orange County a little longer. So we're going to hope and work with the County Board of Supervisor, Supervisors, my colleague, Supervisor Morlock, um, former chairman of the Board of Supervisors last year, and also OC Parks and the rest of my colleagues to hopefully be able to move this and extend this longer in Orange County because two weeks is not enough for us. We've got two, we have over three million people in Orange County. So the more we can reach and the more people we can, can see this, the better it is. Again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity for having, uh, allowing me to be here. I want to uh, thank all the veterans here today, the veterans organizations, the first responders, I never liked that phrase, first responders. I like the phrase, the police, the sheriffs, the firefighters, who keep us safe, help to ensure our freedoms, and who interact with our community. Very often, they are the individuals who interact with our community. So we're grateful that the Santa Ana Police Department welcomed us into their midst. They've been wonderfully welcoming. Uh, we couldn't be happier about that. And we want to thank the veterans and we want to thank the first responders, and we want to thank especially the Santa Ana Police Department, and we want to thank the acting chief of the Santa Ana Police Department uh, who has gone out of his way to make us comfortable. Thank you. I would now like to ask <laughs> the acting chief of the Santa Ana Police Department, Carlos Rojas, to come up and to say a few words, please. Well, thank you very much for joining us today on this important day. And uh, the message that I do want to send out is really directed at our youth that uh, line the walls here of the community room. And I think oftentimes we get caught up in the day-to-day -day things that we do in our lives. And now with technology, many of the young folks doing their Facebook and their social media type things. And oftentimes history goes by us and we don't even realize it. So before you all leave here today, I encourage all the youth to take a look around, look at some of these exhibits, read some of these exhibits, and see what atrocities were done, and to really make that commitment and ensure that these things don't happen again, because they happen because of actions and inactions of leaders throughout the world. And it was tyranny like we've never seen before and that we hopefully never see again. So for the youth in this room, I do strongly encourage that you take, uh, take the time to view some of these exhibits and read them. And uh, for everyone else, thank you very much for coming to the Santa Ana Police Community Room. It's a true honor to host this exhibit here. And I know the members of our city council, the mayor and city staff are very appreciative to have this exhibit hosted here. So thank you very much. I should add that there are three individuals who have worked closely with us who deserve recognition. 
I'm terrible at names, so forgive me if I don't pronounce your names properly, but Anthony uh, Bertagna. Anthony, are you here? Very good, way back there, okay. And Loretta Tofoda, Loretta, are you here? I probably didn't pronounce her name properly, so I'm glad she's not here. And Sarah Mason, Sarah, are you here? Well, let me tell you, those three people have just been wonderful and we're very grateful. Uh, you've got a great staff, Chief, thank you so much. Uh, I take it as appropriate to call you chief, not acting chief. That, yeah? Good. Um, is the Santa Ana mayor here? He said he might be able to come by. Okay, I don't see him now. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, Supervisor John Morlock, who is my supervisor, so I'm happy to tell you he's my supervisor. He's also my friend and he just stepped down as chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. He does a great job for this county, he does a great job for us all, and I'm proud to have him represent me. John? Thank you, Dr. Ballister. I know you want to shorten our speeches, so I'm going to change mine. And I just want to say that it's great to see so many teenagers and young people in the room. My father was born in 1927 in the province of Groningen in northern Netherlands. That made him about 12, 13 years old when the war started. My mother was born in 1930, and she was nine years old when the war started. When you were occupied by the Nazis, your guns were removed, and your radios were removed. You were not allowed to listen to radio. You were not allowed to have firearms. If there was a problem in the province, uh, you didn't need a lot of troops. You just needed to take the mayor, put him to the town center, and kill him. That's how you kind of kept force. You just kind of said, if you're going to step out of line, we're just going to shoot someone you know, and that'll help remind you that you need to monitor what you do here. Because there was a resistance, and there were also sympathizers. So it made the life real interesting. Three of my mother's brothers would have to hide during the war uh, so they would not get conscripted either into the Nazi army or uh, to do slave labor in factories. So the World War II is very close to me personally. I was born in the province of Groningen, and after the war, the Dutch government asked for an analysis of what happened, and the result was a book called The Destruction of the Dutch Jews by Jacob Presser. Um, if you want to meet me at the library after this, uh, I'd be more than happy to read the book to you. Um, but, <laughs> but for today, I just want to read um, just one small section, and I'll conclude. Just that. Um, this was a, a report, and, and this book was very dis difficult for me to read because this was a report of the, uh, how the Germans were dealing with the Jews in my province, my county where I was born. As usual, the Germans were not remiss in making their own contribution uh, to the Jewish festival of Purim on March 21st, which is when you celebrate uh, the, the victory of the Jews over their enemies, and the Germans reversed it. And the head of the SS, the uh, uh, kind of the police department for the Germans in, in Germany, uh, Mr. Rauter, uh, the head of the entire force, gave an address where he tr you know, treated the Dutch SS on the day of the festival itself on Purim, and in it he reminded his audience that before the Germans had arrived, there were 140,000 full Jews in the Netherlands, including a number of foreigners whom we could not touch for international reasons. However, the whole of Jewry is due for expulsion to the east. 55,000 had already been shoved out. Router asked his audience to keep this to themselves, and 12,000 were in camps, so that 67,000 of, of the 140,000 had been purged from the life of the Dutch nation. But even that was not fast enough. From April, there would be two trains a week carrying a total of 12,000 Jews per month, with the result that, the, that in the foreseeable future, no Jews would be walking about in the Dutch streets. The only exceptions would be those married to non-Jews to whom we shall have something to say later Router added he would be very glad indeed to see the end of the Jewish question for the simple reason that as those of the security service will agree, Jews invariably have a finger in all espionage and terrorist activities. Until the Jews are gone, we shall never get any peace. 
To get rid of them would not be a night nice, would, would would not be a nice task. It is a dirty work. And I'll I'll, I'll skip to say that at the end of the, these remarks, it says, I shall gladly answer with my soul for what crimes I have committed against the Jews, Router said laughing. Sorry to read that to you, but uh, um, it gets awfully personal when your folks have gone through World War II and when all your dad and mom can do when it comes to going to movies is take you to Torah, 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 or Patton, because it was so embedded in their memories. We should never forget. My folks will never forget. Thank you very much. John, I was born on Purim, 1941. And uh, dates like that mean a great deal to me. I should tell you that Supervisor Morlock is a real expert on Jewish history, not being Jewish. He sends me articles regularly. He sends me journals regularly. Uh, he studies the history of Jews in the Western United States and California. And he's about as learned as any man I know. So, John, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, we have with us, and we're very grateful to have with us, a member of the Santa Ana uh, uh, City Council, uh, Mr. Uh, and I'm not going to, I hope I'm going to do justice uh, to your name, sir, but, uh, uh, and um, Mr. Sarmiento, is that right? Okay. I wanted to say it right. And he's Ward 1 of the Santa Ana City Council, and we're delighted to have him here. Thank today. you, sir. You know, your, your pronunciation is not as bad as, as most, so I've, I've been called worse as well. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, on behalf of the City Council and uh, our mayor, who's not present and sends his regrets for not being here, he has a family member who's very ill and wanted to be here with you. Um, we want to welcome you to Santa Ana, number one. Um, uh, number two, I'm just... Uh, very, very happy to see as many people as I do before us. Uh, we know this is the first leg of this uh, exhibit touring, and we're honored that it's here in Santa Ana. So thank you all. And with that, uh, let me just make a few remarks. Um, we want to welcome the Simon Wiesenthal Center's renowned Holocaust exhibit, The Courage to Remember, to Santa Ana. Uh, and we want to thank the Foundation uh, for California, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, SNCF, for facilitating the showing here at the Santa Ana Police Department. Holocaust education is a, is a responsibility of all of us. Law enforcement, houses of worship, schools, government, and families. This educational tool helps to strengthen our efforts at remembering this tragic episode. And I'm most um, you know, glad to see that we have a lot of young people here who um, are listening and are gonna be learning because we know it's a courage to remember and that's the theme of it, but it has to be a covenant and a commitment to remember because we know as our experiences change, as our demographies develop, um, these moments in time, these moments in history, sometimes get away from us, and we see them as things that happened in the past. But what we have to realize is that the reason it's important for us to remember is because we have recurring um, themes of hate that surface, and we're not immune here in our county. As, our, as the face of our county changes, as it becomes um, uh, more Latino, more Hispanic, we realize that our uh, residents here in Santa Ana, 80% um, of them are Latino, suffer from that same um, injustice that uh, many of you in the Jewish community have experienced. And that's our concern as leaders here, because we realize that we, we'd like to prevent and insulate our children and our families from those um, uh, gestures of hate, but we can't. So what's our best tool? Our best tool is education. Our best tool is to inform people that these things have happened in the past, and they've happened to degrees that we can't even fathom. But it's our responsibility to make sure that they are raised, understanding what can happen if we let complacency take, uh, uh, take effect. And I think if we're silent, our silence is acquiescence. So we have to make sure that we speak with a long or strong voice and a unified voice when we say these things cannot be tolerated anymore. Injustice in our time, hopefully, um, we may not be able to eradicate it, but we certainly can minimize its impact. So working together um, here, in, here in the city of Santa Ana, we want to welcome you, and we hope that this is a series of conversations that we have, of forums and symposiums that we can host, because we realize that the time is ripe now, that we educate these young minds and make sure that they understand what can happen when we sit and be in, in silence. So we want to thank you all for being here. 
We know that uh, the exhibit's going to be here for two weeks. I want to thank uh, the supervisors for being present, and, uh, uh, Sheriff Hutchins, uh, Chief, and, and the department here for, uh, for housing this. We, uh, we certainly wish you much, much success because we know that the message is an important one, and we're just very, very honored that you came here to, to, to kick it off here in the city of Santa Ana. Welcome and enjoy the exhibit. Thank you. We're really honored to have our next speaker, uh, Sheriff Hutchins, Sheriff of Orange County. Uh, she is a spectacular public servant. Someone asked her, I believe, just before this exhibit opened, why this is taking place at a police station, police headquarters. Well, the answer, I think, is clear. First of all, they welcomed us in. Very important point. But also, uh, the police are there to keep us safe. This uh, protect us against hate crimes, to protect us against the kind of intolerance that leads to violence. But it's only half of it, because the other half of it is education. The two uh, pillars of fighting hate and intolerance are the police on one hand and education on the other. Really glad all you guys are here today. Really happy you're here, you young people. So we are really delighted to have Sheriff Hutchins here. and. Uh, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let her do the talking. Well, good morning. And I want to thank the foundation for inviting me to speak at what I consider a very important event, a very important exhibit. Um, I have tried to educate myself on World War II, on the Holocaust. And uh, as I thought about my comments today, I just wanted to share that I've visited the Simon Wiesenthal Museum uh, of Tolerance. They have a program there, Tools for Law Enforcement, that uh, a number of our agencies participate in. Um, I have uh, had a long working relationship with my good friend Mark Ketrick, and we traveled to Russia together, who has uh, been in charge of that program for a very long time. And we traveled to Russia uh, to teach, to try and change the culture about hate crime um, to, to try and uh, educate on how to prosecute and how to prevent hate crimes. Um, I visited the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and I would say to the young people, if you ever have the opportunity to do that, it is quite um, a, a, an education. And um, I visited uh, Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Center in Jerusalem, which um, I, I just have to share they have an exhibit there, or they had an exhibit uh, uh, that showed life, Jewish life before the war, before the Holocaust. And then you go through and you find what happened during the Holocaust and at the end. And it is very moving to see you have, you're living a normal life one day and the next day your world is turned upside down. I have tried to educate myself, but I will never understand the horror and the atrocities that occurred during the Holocaust and that's why we must continue to do education today so that something so unspeakable cannot occur again. Um, I want to um, share, there was a program, and this was in New Jersey, and it's, I'm sure it's been many, many places, lest we forget. And there was a study tour in 2003 where participants visited Auschwitz with Rabbi, Rabbi Murray Cohn a survivor of that camp. As you probably know, Auschwitz was the largest concentration camp established by Nazi Germany. Over 1.1 million Jews were deported there from virtually every nation or every country in Europe. At least 96,000 Jews were killed there. Rabbi Kohn made this compelling statement to the participants that day who were high school students, by the way. And they had toured the camp. His comments, to me, illuminate why it is so important to hear the voices of the survivors. He said this, if you think that you were now with me, that you have been in Auschwitz, you have never been in Auschwitz. I will deny it in your faces. You visited the place, but not Auschwitz. You can never understand what Auschwitz was and what Auschwitz will be for us who remember it. So please 
be humble. You will say I visited Auschwitz, not I was in Auschwitz. This is selected exclusively for those who were here, not to minimize your experience, but be careful. Empathy is great, but direct experience is beyond description. It is a matter of mind. I don't feel the pain anymore. The only thing left is my number. But I realize that Auschwitz has never left me. I think that's a pretty powerful statement. And I will close with a quote that I think is apropos. Irish statesman Edmund Burke said, and this is going to be a very familiar quote, but one that we have to keep in mind. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. There were a lot of good men and women, brave men and women, who risked their lives to save others during this dark period in our collective history. Let's look into our hearts and endeavor always to have the courage, the honor, and the morality to stand against evil and stand together for all of humanity. Thank you. I understand that we have the mayor of Newport Beach here. Is he here? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Mayor Keith Curry, mayor of Newport Beach. Thank you very much. It's indeed an honor to, uh, to be with you today. The uh, title of the program is The Courage to Remember. But what exactly is it that we should remember? Let me suggest a few things. First, we should remember the victims. It is our duty to ensure that they did not die in vain, and these panels tell their stories. And we should all learn these stories. We should remember the liberators, many of them here, some in uniform who sacrificed their lives uh, to bring this atrocity to an end and the role that our nation played in that liberation. But we should also remember that the capacity for hate and depravity to do unimaginable things is very real. It was real then, and it's real today. That the right to call yourselves a civilized human being is not inherent. It's a right that must be earned, and it can be lost. Indeed, an entire nation forfeited that title during this period. We must remember that there were warning signs to despotism and depravity. In 1938, you could see what was going on, but the world did nothing. The words of political despots have meaning and must be taken seriously, and they must be held accountable. We should remember that, sadly, the lessons of the Holocaust are not confined to World War II, but they were revisited in our world, in Soviet Russia, with the Khmer Rouge, in Bosnia, in Rwanda. But even as we speak today, the Taliban seeks to terrorize entire populations, to eliminate those of different religious views, and to erase traces of great civilizations. Again, reminding us that the title of civilized man must be earned. It's not inherent. And finally, we must remember that the responsibility to stand up to the forces of darkness rests on each of us, and that collectively we must never forget, and we must never allow this to happen again. Thank you. We're getting close to the end of our program, so there is hope. I want to introduce uh, Lee Gift, who is the director of the Museum of Tolerance for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, she is the creative force there. She's the organizational force there. She does a spectacular job. I've been associated with the Simon Wiesenthal Center for 25 years now, and I can tell you it has never operated better under Liba's direction, and so we are very grateful to have her. Thank you very much, Dr. Balliser. Distinguished dignitaries, special guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to participate in this auspicious occasion and gratefully acknowledge the diligent efforts of the Foundation for California to travel this important exhibition throughout the state, and also for the generosity and the commitment of the Santa Ana Police Department for hosting the Courage to Remember exhibition. As the Sheriff noted, the Museum of Tolerance enjoys a long and a strong relationship with many of the law enforcement agencies in Orange County who participate in our acclaimed Tools for Tolerance for Law Enforcement Training programs. 
we commend law enforcement for being in the vanguard of cutting-edge training, taking full advantage of the unique resources and the innovative opportunities at the Museum of Tolerance. As the title of this exhibition suggests, it requires courage to remember. But why the Holocaust? And why now? Let me elaborate briefly on some of the eloquent and uh, poignant comments of Dr. Ballitz and others before. Although the history of mankind is marked and marred by many mass atrocities, the Holocaust in Nazi-dominated Europe from 1933 to 1945 is unique in its scope, the deliberation with which it was executed, and the terrible modernity of the gas chambers and the crematoria which were its principal means. It's true that most of the millions and millions of victims were Jews. But the story of the Holocaust is not exclusively a Jewish story. Nor is it only a German story. The Nazis succeeded in murdering the Jews of Europe, not only because of their fanatical commitment to the final solution, but because no nation in the civilized world intervened, heeded the threats, provided refuge from the slaughterers. The import of the Holocaust transcends all lines of religion and of race. The human significance is universal. The courage and morality of every society are constantly on trial, and in a crisis, they're tested to the limits. The Holocaust teaches us that terrible things happen when we forget history and our shared humanity and succumb to ignorance and fear and hate. Last Sunday, January 27th, 68 years since Soviet troops liberated the death camps at, Bir at uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, also marked the seventh consecutive year that the United States, uh, the United Nations Holocaust Memorial Day was observed at the UN and throughout most of Europe. It took them a long time to designate a day of commemoration one which urges every member nation of the United Nations to honor the memory of Holocaust victims and encourages the development of educational programs about Holocaust history to help prevent future acts of genocide. Their charter reads, it rejects any denial of the Holocaust as an event and condemns all manifestations of religious intolerance, incitement, harassment or violence against persons or communities based on belief. The annual act of commemoration, of course, cannot be an escape from the ongoing historical and political struggles to make this world safe for decency and for tolerance. In the case of the United Nations, the seeming consensus for Resolution 60-7 was challenged almost immediately by the Islamic Republic of Iran's announcement of a so-called international conference to review the global vision of the Holocaust. The global hate fest drew Holocaust deniers from everywhere, dedicated, in the words of Iranian President Ahmadinejad, to wipe Israel off the map. Yet Holocaust denial is not the only enemy to the future's promise. So are Holocaust distortion, revisionism, and relativization, the dangerous campaign currently being conducted mostly in Eastern Europe to undermine the status of the Shoah as a unique historical tragedy and to hide or at least minimize the role of local Nazi collaborators. Beware Holocaust ignorance and indifference reflected in the statistic that 30% of enlightened Sweden's youth either say they know nothing about the Holocaust or doubt that it occurred. And then there is the insidious destructive force of Holocaust minimization and trivialization, like the toxic ash that poisons the atmosphere after a volcanic eruption, the ugly smile that mocks the past and tempts us to repeat it is in evidence far and wide. It ranges from the neo-Nazi tattoos worn by young members of Greece's Golden Dawn who march in the shadow of the Parthenon, to the practitioners of Hitler Schick, who buy t-shirts in trendy shops in Tokyo, to the studious young who read texts revealing Nazi management principles 
that are taught in the graduate business schools in Mumbai. With the passage of time, as living history passes into the realm from which legend and myth are made, we have a more urgent imperative to deny victory to historical falsifiers whose road to power is embodied in the terrible warning of George Orwell's 1984. He who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. The most powerful testaments to the truth are eyewitness accounts, those by liberators and the righteous among the nations, but most especially Holocaust survivors, who redefine the meaning of heroism for the present and the future. They're not our conventional heroes of the battlefield or the boardroom, not simulacra of our celebrity-obsessed society. They are the true modern and postmodern heroes whose, currents, whose courage, endurance, and survival under the weight of crushing burdens give us hope that the human spirit can triumph over the worst that the powers of evil and the heartlessness of history can do to us. I am honored that Holocaust survivor Elaine Geller has come here with us today and will share some words with you shortly. The German philosopher Karl Jasper said, that which has happened is a warning. To forget it is guilt. It must be continually remembered. It was possible for this to happen and it remains possible for it to happen again at any minute. Only in knowledge can it be prevented. I sincerely hope that over the next fortnight, and perhaps even longer, based on what the county supervisor said earlier, prodigious numbers of residents of Orange County will come and see this exhibition, will learn from it, and be inspired by it to engage the present and to help shape a bright, safe, and peaceful future. Thank you. I should add, college professors are used to speaking without a microphone. I should add that you all must visit the Museum of Tolerance in the west side of Los Angeles. This just gives you a taste, a very small taste, of the resources and the educational experience that you'll have at the Museum of Tolerance. So after that, those stirring remarks by Liebe Geft, I hope you'll all visit. Before I ask our survivor to speak, I have uh, one uh, further duty, and that is the, uh, uh, the um, SNCF, the French National Railway, is the third partner that has made all of this happen. To be blunt, they provide a generous grant to the Foundation for California, which allows us to make this happen. And they provided a grant which has allowed us to take this up and down the state of California, in Florida, we hope to open soon at the Martin Luther King Museum and Memorial, in Atlanta, and in many other venues. So we're very grateful to them. Mr. Alain Leray, who is the president of SNCF America, could not be here today, sent a message, said, Fred, if you're running late in the program, cut it down. So I'm going to take his advice, and I'm going to cut it down. But I just want to tell you the following. His grandparents were survivors and his parents were survivors. And so Holocaust education means something very important to him. Uh, he's grateful that you could all be here today, but he said, some of you are asking yourselves, why is the French National Railway sponsoring Holocaust education in California? As many of you are probably aware, SNCF, the French National Railway, participated in one of history's greatest atrocities, the deportation from France of 76,000 Jews and others to death camps during the Holocaust, mostly to Auschwitz. As in other occupied nations, the Nazis commandeered the French rail facilities and used them for their evil plans. <clears throat> SNCF has dedicated itself to Holocaust education and to supporting worthy programs of remembrance and education. I had the pleasure of meeting with the chairman of SNCF in Paris in November. And he said to me, we don't seek business. We want Holocaust education. We want Holocaust education. We want Holocaust education. He said it three times, banging the desk. He speaks English, by the way, perfectly well. I left thrilled, inspired. 
So I just wanted to let you know that SNCF plays a very important role in what we do here today. We are, we're delighted to have a survivor with us. Elaine Geller is a survivor. She works with the Simon Wiesenthal Center, sharing her story for the center and the museum in many venues. Our opening would never be complete without a survivor because it's all about them. Uh, we often have liberators, vets. We often have Americans who have liberated the death camps because they have compelling stories. They were there. They saw what happened. Anyone deny to an American liberator that it happened, and you better watch out for your nose. And also, equally important, maybe more important, the survivors of the death camps. Elaine, would you come up here and share just a few words with us? We'd be most grateful. This is going to be very brief, but I must say before I tell you just a little bit about myself, that if a survivor gets anything wonderful in this world is to see the variations, the differences that are interested in making this a better world, that it never happens again. My name is Elaine Norwich Geller, and I'm a child Holocaust survivor. I was four and a half, or maybe less, when I went into the first uh, encounter, and I was liberated in Bergen-Belsen at eight and a half, almost five years. In the very brief time, almost as soon as the Nazis came into my town that I was born in, called Wojcisław in Poland, I lost my grandparents, my mother was killed in front of me, and I thank God every day that I didn't fully understand, but later on was told, I don't remember when. I lost my sister, I lost all of my family. So when I hear that it didn't happen, I wonder and fear what, what will happen when the survivors are gone. And when I see you all and hear you all, I feel great. For me, the only outlet, and it took me a while, that I had was to find a place that needed my story, and it's, it's lengthy and I'm not going to go into it now. And I found the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Museum of Tolerance, and it is more hope than I can remember. I do this because to be quiet in the face of evil is to give Hitler a victory. I speak in all over the city, state, and even beyond that. And I will just say, I'm not going to um, say much more, that in one place, I th believe it was a college, a young man asked me, how did you feel when you heard that Hitler was dead? I said, young man, I'm not Irish, but I danced the jig. <laughs> and you all, Your presence in this room, knowing that it's people of all religions, faiths, and so on, is the thing that is medicine to my soul, and I will speak about this with the intent of prevention for the rest of my life. Thank you. There are so many people here who deserve recognition that I'm embarrassed to say I can't recognize them all, and if I forget someone, please forgive me. We have representatives of the Royal Thai uh, Consulate. We have representatives of the Consulate of Hungary. We have representatives of uh, the uh, Consulate of Poland. We have representatives of the Consulate of France. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some people right now but a number of uh, 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 consulates in Los Angeles have sent representatives here today, and we are very grateful. We're going to have two representatives of those consulates conclude the program. I should also tell you that we have many important, many important uh, uh, people representing elected civic figures. 
We have representatives from the office of Congressman Ed Royce. We have representatives from the office of Congressman Dana Rohrbacher. We have representatives from the office of Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, Loretta Sanchez, sorry. We have uh, representatives uh, from the office of Gary, Congressman Gary Miller. We have representatives from Assemblywoman Bonnie Lowenthal from the Long Beach area. We have representatives from Assemblymember Diane Harkey. Uh, we have representatives from the state Senate uh, seat of uh, uh, Lou Korea. I hope I have not left anyone out, and I should tell you, we also have representatives from a number of cities which I have not gotten to, including two representatives from the city of Cyprus, the Mayor Pro Tem, Leroy Mills, and Rob Johnson, and we're very grateful to have you all here today. We're going to conclude the program now. Yeah, let's have a round of applause. With two members from the Council of Corps, His Excellency, the Honorable Yuri Resnick, who's Deputy Council General of the Consulate of Israel. Yuri, would you please come up and say a few words? Distinguished leaders, Santa Ana and Orange County, my distinguished uh, colleague, Deputy Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, Excellencies, members of the Consular Corps, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by thanking the Foundation for California, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the French National Railroad, for making this important event possible and for putting this exhibit into place to enable so many people, and especially the young people among us, to uh, come to grips and to witness this sordid chapter uh, in human history and to learn its lessons. Despite the 70 or so years that have transpired uh, since the Holocaust, it's still difficult to contemplate the magnitude of the crime that was committed against the Jewish people, which is underscored also by the inaction of the enlightened world, the enlightened nations during the Second World War, despite the fact that knowledge of what was transpiring was available in real time and the means did exist to do something about it, and yet nothing was done until it was too late. Um, I wish it were possible in today's world to say that we live in a different world where such things couldn't happen anymore, where uh, forces of evil are confronted in an effective way and the machinery of the distortions and lies which are their bulwark are equally confronted. But the frank truth is that we do not live in such a world. Today's day and age, even today, there is a member state of the United Nations which openly calls for the annihilation of my country, of the state of Israel and of the Jewish people. Just several months ago, the president of this country was welcomed in open arms as he is every, years, every year in the General Assembly in New York. And so I think we still live in a time where these concerns are very real. The threat posed by Iran is, of course, of a global nature, and it poses a threat to the immediate, the states in the immediate vicinity of Iran and the Gulf countries. But for Israel, it's a very immediate, imminent, existential threat. Mein Kampf was published first in 1925 and laid out in very clear, cold, crisp, cold-blooded terms the intent that Hitler had for the Jewish people which within several short years materialized. Unlike 70 years ago, today there is an independent sovereign state of the Jewish people, the state of Israel. And I can tell you that when we say never again, we mean it. So allow me without further ado to again thank you all thank the organizers, the Foundation for California again, and the Museum of Tolerance, the Simon Wiesenthal Center for putting this together. It is so very important to keep the awareness and the knowledge of what happened so that we can do what we can to prevent it from happening again. Thank you. Our last speaker is His Excellency, the Honorable Stefan Bitterman, who's Deputy Counsel General 
of the Consulate of the Federal Republic of Germany. Please. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Stefan Biedermann from the German Consulate General. After all we've heard, it is not very easy to say something meaningful. So if you permit, I'd um, give you a personal remark. Since I have been a young boy and heard for the first time through German media and at school what has happened between 1933 and 45 in Germany, in the first place I couldn't believe it because the country that I have lived in that time for six, seven, eight years, I couldn't just imagine that the people around me were the ones who were responsible for the greatest crime, the greatest atrocity that mankind has ever seen. Since then, it has always accompanied me through my life. I wanted to know how could that happen? How could my people do something like that? How could a people that has achieved such great cultural products, music, books, literature, philosophy, how could these people end up being a horde of bandits allowing the Nazis to guide them into the worst thing that ever has happened on earth. I even decided then to take up studies in history. I majored in history at university because I wanted to know. And still today, if you ask me, I cannot explain. That doesn't mean that we, don't, we are not able to draw some lessons of what has happened. And um, we've heard that this topic, Holocaust education, is a very important one. And I can assure you that in Germany, no kid at school would not at least two or three times be taught about what has happened at different stages of age because, well, you can imagine, kids at different, different ages have different approaches to understand what has happened. They are also being taught that the Germans weren't even able to liberate themselves of this Nazi devils, as the first speaker today said. If not, our American friends wouldn't have done the job for us. And that's why I'm very happy to see some of the veterans here. It was the Americans with the French and the British and the Soviets who liberated us from that guy and his band of, um, of well, I would say, terrorists. But Nowadays, how do you teach the young generation? How do you bring over the message? Um, fortunately, they, we still have um, the witnesses, people who can tell their stories. Um, the Shoah Foundation, as you know, made that their goal to produce footage of any witness they could find. And I'm very happy that we have it. And I have to say, I feel embarrassed that we Germans didn't have the idea um, to start a project like that, that it was um, Steven Spielberg and the Americans who started that. I only arrived here six months ago in the United States and here in California, I have to, be, I have to say I'm very impressed about this culture of Holocaust education you're having here. The Museum of Tolerance, the Museum of the Holocaust, the Shoah Foundation, each of them I find even personally are very impressive projects to show what has happened and even do it in a very smart, didactic way to bring over the message to the future generations. We have heard a lot of bleak things today. Um, if you permit, I would like to end my little statement with, well, um, if you um, permit me the expression, a positive news. We have in Germany now growing Jewish communities. If you take the opportunity and visit my country and you go to the big cities, for example, to Berlin, you will see that there are growing Jewish communities. And it's maybe an irony of history that many of the Jews that are now in these communities in German cities have fled other countries. Many have come in from the Soviet, former Soviet Union from Russia, ending up in Berlin, living there, becoming German citizens even, and forming Jewish communities. So if you permit me to put that in one sentence, 
Hitler hasn't had his victory. The Jewish communities exist, they grow, and I sincerely hope that for my kids and my grandkids, they will find Jewish life a normal part of their life in Germany, and I think, I think everything for that is going in the right direction. So thanks to everybody who has organized uh, this very impressive um, um, exhibition. Thanks to the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Thanks to SNCF. And thanks to Santa Ana Police Department. And thank you for inviting me. We're really grateful that all these students are here today. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, you're all from Santa Ana High School. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. OK. That's a spectacular turnout. All of us who made speeches, that's fine, but you're the future. There's hate out there about Hispanics, there's hate out there about Asians, there's hate out there about African Americans, there's hate out there about Jews, and only you will be able to stand up to that in the future. So please read this, imbibe it, take it into your minds, share it with your friends, and get them down here to see the exhibit, and then go to the Wiesenthal Center's Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles to see the big one. Thank you for being here. We're now going to have a ribbon cutting ceremony. Everyone who spoke, would you please come up to the front because you're going to participate in our ribbon cutting. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's cut that ribbon. The exhibit is formally open. Thank you all for being here today.